Well, good morning again, everybody. Uh, this is uh, another week of our series, Address the Mess. And so each week we've been talking about in this series how life in general, we would all be able to say this with honesty and truth, that life is messy, right? There are times where life is just straight up messy, and we've been there before, and like I said, we can relate to it, and it's been something that either we've created, I've created a mess, or I've helped be in a mess, or sometimes it just is an unavoidable mess, right? That it's outside of our control and circumstances, and, and life is just messy, right? I was thinking this week, you know, talking about, you know, this same topic, the same series, the same area of messiness in life, uh, many of you know we traveled uh, to our family, back to our family in Kentucky, and uh, this past week and got a chance to spend some time, kids got to spend some time out on the farm and got to spend some time with grandparents and cousins, and um, how many of you know that, that family can be messy, right? Family can be messy sometimes when it comes to our, our, our you know, extended family as well as our immediate family. It could just be sometimes messy, but we get a chance to celebrate Christmas together. That's something we haven't got a chance to do uh, in quite a while, even though it was a little bit later, that's okay. Uh, you know, the kids got to, to have such a good time. We brought back a whole suitcase of, of the, the darts, you know, the, the, air, the air rifles and all that kind of stuff, a whole suitcase full of that stuff. And uh, man, they had such a great time. Uh, the downer was it rained the whole time we were in Kentucky. I mean, every single day it rained and not just a little bit, it rained a lot. And so we were hoping for snow, but it wasn't cold enough. And so instead of snow, we got a lot of rain, a lot of mud. Now, here's the thing, you know, some of you know this, if you ever got to go visit places in the country or whatever the case is, and they get a lot of rain, and, and just like we had for many, many, many days, and it creates plenty of mud. And how do you know what you do on the farm when there's plenty of mud? What do you do? You make a mess, right? You make a mess of some kind. And let me just tell you, we did, we made a mess. We got the four wheelers out, we got some other ATVs and we rode in the mud for a couple days and had such a few, in fact, I got a few pics I wanna show you this morning, you know, and, and again, this could have been us, it wasn't exactly us, but I mean, we were, it was similar to this, what we were doing and, and, and go ahead and show the next one, you know, uh, you know, this is kind of what we look like afterwards, right? And, and the boys, especially uh, Grady and Brody, man, Grady rode his first, he rode, he, he really drove his first four wheeler, he, you know, the, Seven years old, man, he, that's, how you, that's what you teach them to do on the farm, right? And so uh, the next pick, too, is pretty funny, too. I mean, it's just, it's one of those things um, that you do whenever there's a lot of mud, you make a mess. And this really wasn't too far off from our messes. I mean, it really wasn't. You got to kind of hose off as you come in. But um, life is like that, isn't it, right? I mean, life is messy at times. And maybe, maybe you're in a season right now, we've been saying this from the very beginning, maybe you're in a season of life right now that's kind of messy, you know, maybe not. Maybe, maybe in the season that you're in, it's not as chaotic as it has been. It's not as crazy as it has been. But the thing is that we've been saying, and, and this is so true, isn't it? I mean, you evaluate this for yourself. It's, it's sometimes not as easy to identify our own messes, but it's very easy to identify other people's messes. Right? We can look around and we can identify other people's messes. And, and what we've been saying from the beginning of this series is, and I think this is such a freeing statement, that before we go and we judge someone else and for their mess and before we're too critical of them and whatever mess that they're in, I think this is such a freeing statement and it's kind of a confession, if you will. And it's simply this, I know a mess when I see one because I am one, right? I mean, seriously, I mean, if you talk about just a, a very freeing statement that we can all make today, I know a mess when I see one because I am one. And, and it's true, from, from the Bible's perspective, pretty much says the same thing. The Bible says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we've all messed up. We've all fallen short, as the Bible says, whether it's with our finances, whether it's with our, you know, uh, uh, overextending ourselves too much, you know, and, and with our finances, whether it's, you know, our health in general, you know, sometimes we can do that and, and, and we can, you know, forget about caring about what we eat and we can forget about dieting and we can forget about, you know, all these different things. We can mess up our health. You know, maybe it's our careers. It's our jobs. Maybe we've messed up on the job. We've messed up our career in some way. Maybe, maybe you're still in school and you've messed up your grades. 
Maybe you've messed up, you know, just academically somewhere along the way, and, and you don't know if it's ever going to be, uh, you know, be able to recover, you know, wh- whatever the case is. And, and I don't want you to raise your hand this morning, but I mean, we've messed up a lot. I mean, think about relationships, for example. I mean, again, don't raise your hand, but how many of us have messed up a relationship or two or ten, right? I mean, we've done that. And, and maybe you feel like right now, you know, you're a mess, you're messing up your marriage. Maybe you feel like, you, you know, you're messing up a relationship that's so important to you. Maybe it's with your son, maybe it's with your daughter. Whatever it is, we can all pretty much, and we can all relate to this, say to ourselves, you know what, I've made a mess. And even if you can't think of something, the truth is, and again, I, I think this is something that's true for all of us, even if you can't think of a mess that you're in or you can't think of a mess that you've been in before, the truth is you're only one decision away for making a mess, potentially. Not just in your life, maybe in someone else's life. Now, all that sounds pretty negative, right? And it sounds like, it, oh, you know, Will, you just come here and you've, you know, here you've been gone a week and now you're just coming back and you're giving all this downers kind of message and stuff. The good news is, and this is what we've been saying, this is so important. The good news is the beauty of the gospel is simply this. It's in our mess that we begin to see God. We begin to see God's thumbprint. In fact, what the Bible describes to us is that God comes to us in our messes. And that's what we see in and through Jesus. God coming to us in our mess. John 3, 16, again, the, the most, one of the most popular verses in all the Bible. We've been saying this verse each week, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And, and so what that says to us in, in the context of what we're talking about is God so loved our messy world, right? Because we've already said that, that's the truth, that he came into our mess, right? To what? To save us from our mess. I mean, that is the beauty of the gospel, isn't it? Jesus coming into our mess to save us from our mess. Jesus loves the little messes, all the little messes of the world, right? We need to not look any further than to Jesus to know that this message we're talking about, this gospel message is so true. Just look at his life, look at his ministry. And, 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 and we see this over and over and over and over again. A couple of weeks ago, if you were here, again, if you missed any of our message, you go online, catch up to all of our messages. But a couple of weeks ago, we talked about a couple of big messes. We talked about Zacchaeus and how he was such a mess and Jesus met him. We talked about the woman at the well and, and how her life was just in such disarray and such a mess and Jesus met her and he met them right in the middle of their mess to help them out of it last week. So thank you for Chris. Chris preached to a great message talking about the, the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. What a mess that was. And Jesus coming into that mess, right in the middle of it. And the, these, these are messy people, aren't they? But they're messy people just like us. And, and I hope that you've been able to see this so far throughout this series, this, this message that is so important to us. And that is, you know, whatever mess that you may be in right now, no matter how big, no matter how complicated it is, I hope that you hear and I hope that you understand, I hope that you're reminded each and every single week, I hope that this is a reminder each and every morning that you wake up and you think, you know what, God, things are are just so messy right now, but God, I am am assured, I know, God, you love me. And and yeah, God, I mean, again, we, we have to make this confession, you know, life is so messy, God, but you love me and you're gonna be with me right here in the middle of this mess. And not only that, God, but you're gonna be with me even after I'm out of this mess, whatever it is. And it's so important that we begin to see and understand this. And, and that Christianity, because this is what I think a lot of people tend to turn Christianity into. Christianity isn't this sick cycle of repeating the same mistakes time in and time out, getting into the same messes over and over and over and over again. It's not about sinning and asking for forgiveness and sinning and asking for forgiveness and sinning and asking for forgiveness. It's not about this, this six cycle carousel that we sometimes create of, you know what, I just keep messing up the same way over and over and over and over again. And so God, I'm going to have to keep asking for forgiveness over and over over and over and over and over again for the same things that I just keep messing up for. And what I want you to hear, what I want you to understand is that is really not the picture of Christianity we get in the New Testament. You know what that is? That's a country music song. All right? 
And listen, <laughs> I'm not knocking country music because I'm actually a fan. I love country music. You can't be from Kentucky hardly at all and not be a country music fan of some kind. And so I, I am. I'm, I'm a huge, I'm from Waylon to Willie, right? You know, I'm a, I'm a huge country music fan. But you think about it, you know, there's not a lot. When you hear secular music, and you hear religious threads in songs. I mean, how often is it that it's really a country music song of some kind that you're hearing that in? And, and, and a lot of times, I mean, the theme, you know, it can change from time to time. And, and I'm not saying this is always the case, but a lot of times it is. You know, anytime there's a reference to Jesus, anytime there's a reference to the church, I mean, it kind of goes like this, right? You know, you've, you've heard this before. You know this to be true. You know, well, I've done God and messed up again. Lucky for me, Jesus forgives my sin, Right? Next song that you hear, the very next album that you hear. Well, it looks like I've created the same mess. Sure glad that God is to forgive my mess and bless, right? I mean, same kind of message. And, and like I said, it's not a knock against country music. I, you have to understand, I'm a huge fan, right? I, I, I love, you know, all country music. Eric Church, for example. How many, any, any Eric Church fans, right? Okay, a few of you. I knew, I knew some of you are country music fans. I'm a long gone Waylon song on vinyl, right? In a back row center at a big tent revival, she believes in me and like she believes in her what? Bible, there you go. And loves me like Jesus does. Hey, any country music fans? Come on, raise your hand high, right? Okay, I know I got some of you. What about this one? See if you know this one. This will be fun, right? Because you know Jesus, he drank wine, and I bet we'll get along just fine. He could calm a storm and heal the blind, and I bet he'd understand a heart like mine. Any, anybody know who that is? Anybody? Nobody, really? Nope. Miranda Lambert, right? Miranda Lambert. Here's my point. You know, that's good country music, isn't it? When you, when you hear songs like that, and you hear those lyrics, you think, oh, that's good country music. But you know what? It's not Christianity. That's not what you see in the Bible. Christianity isn't about messing up with the same messes over and over and over and over again, asking for forgiveness over and over and over and over again for the same things. That's sort of like, you know, I was thinking about this, it's sort of like playing Monopoly and having an infinite infinite supply of get out of jail free cards, right? It's like, oh God, I just messed up again and landed in jail. Here's my, God, here's my get out of jail free card. You know, the Bible even talks about this. Paul in, in Romans chapter 6, he kind of says the same thing in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. He says, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And here's the big idea, and I hope that you can get your mind wrapped around this, and I hope that you can understand what it is we're talking about. If all that your faith is, and this may be you this morning, that's okay. If, if this is you, just be honest with yourself. If all your, faith in, uh, all your faith is is a series of simply trying harder and harder and harder, and if all your faith is is about trying to not mess up, trying to not you know, fall back into the same old mess that you've created again and again, if that's all your faith is, not only, listen to me, this is so important, not only will you eventually just wear yourself out from trying harder and harder and harder, and, and not only will you wind up with this warped and inaccurate view of God and a very warped and inaccurate view of who Jesus is in your life, but you're also going to walk away with not understanding who Jesus is according to the scripture and what he has come to do for you. And in fact, I want to talk to you today about a scripture as it relates to this series that we're in, Address the Mess, and I think this passage that we're going to be talking about today is one that I really wish that all of us, I mean, I really believe this. I wish that all of us just had posted somewhere up on the wall of our house. I mean, posted, you know, on, on a bulletin board somewhere, written on your forehead. I don't even care. I mean, but I just wish that this passage that we're talking about today, you know, was something that we all just reminded ourselves of again and again and again. It comes from the book of Philippians chapter 1. If you got your Bibles this morning, you can look there. Philippians chapter 1. If you brought a Bible with you, that's great. If you don't have a Bible, please, we give away Bibles every Sunday, so grab one out at the info booth. Make it your own. If you're using an electronic device, you can look it up on there. And by the way, God is love. That's our, uh, our, our password for the Wi-Fi here. Philippians chapter 1, 
The Apostle Paul is writing the book of Philippians. And by the way, you know, Apostle Paul is one of the greatest church planters we see in the New Testament. He, he planted churches literally all over the place. One of the very first churches that he plants in Europe is this, uh, this church that he planted in the city of Philippi, which again, is, you know, is where Greece is, right? And so many years after Paul helped plant this church, he writes this letter that we're reading here this morning in, in the book of Philippians. It's really not a book, right? And so as you understand, it's a letter, but we call it the book of Philippians. So when Paul wrote this letter, here's what I want you to know. Paul wasn't at the beach. He wasn't at some spa relaxing. In fact, what we understand is Paul was, was, was actually in Rome, and it, that's significant because when he was in Rome, he was in prison. And so during that time, it, the emperor was Nero, and, and just so that you know, I mean, if you're a Christian and you're in Rome and evil uh, Nero is the emperor, if you're a Christian, it's not gonna go well for you. And it didn't go well for Paul, and ultimately, that's where we get this letter here. And he's writing to these Christians in Philippi. He's writing to this church. It becomes a circular letter that is, you know, uh, sent around to different churches, of course. But, but I want you to hear this. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. Look there with me if you can. It says this. I thank my God, he says, every time I remember you. Now, I want you to know, this has been many years since Paul has saw these Christians, many of the ones who have started coming, he probably has never even met before. But, but as he's writing this, this is how he begins. He says, every time I think of you guys, I just can't help but to thank God for you. He says, he goes on to say, he says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. Listen to what he says, from the first day until now. And <clears throat> let me just say, I mean, this is kind of a setup for what it is that he's about to say. It's kind of what I really want to get to this morning. But, but I just wanted to say this because because as I was thinking about this, I was preparing, you know, last week and I was away the week before. I mean, you know, as, as, as I was reading this, I couldn't help but think, you know, just like Paul, you know, I was thinking about our church. I was thinking about so many of you and, and, and how so many of you have done the same thing, man. You have partnered with us in the gospel. You have partnered together as a church family. You committed to Jesus and you've been committed to his church. And I am so thankful for you because of that. And there are many others that would stand on the stage and would say the same thing. So thankful for so many of you. So thankful for our church family. And, and you've made such a difference for Jesus because Jesus has made such a difference in your life. And, and, and I know that it's not just me. Like I said, you, you are like me. You could probably stand up here and say, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for our leaders. I'm so grateful for our youth ministry. I'm so grateful for our children's ministry. I'm so grateful for those of you who lead groups groups in our church that's so important and are starting new groups and I'm so thankful for our welcome team right our greeters those people that are serving in those ministries I'm so thankful for you know diff different um, you know workers that kind of go behind the scenes and do all kinds of things at our church that we don't even think about helping out with the grounds building the grounds cleaning up our church property you know everything from communion preparation everything from you know the you saw the musicians up on the stage our AV team up in the balcony there you know everybody all the way to child care you know Miss Margaret is a, is a good example you know it's every Sunday she loves to serve and be in our nursery and help out with the children there and and, and let me just say this because it's so important the reason that anything good happens for the kingdom of God through CCLG is because of you. It's the truth. You allowing God to do great things through you for his kingdom and his glory. And so I'm so thankful for you. And as much as I am thankful for you, I also want to say, I mean, we are in such a need right now as a church for people to step up into different areas of ministry, again, whether it's children's ministry, whether it's our welcome uh, team uh, ministry, whether it's our, our Connection Cafe. And I want you to consider, if you're not already plugged into a ministry right now, because I don't want to take you away from whatever God is using you, but to consider, Lord, how do you want to use me? What gifts, what passions, what abilities have you given me so that I can use it for your kingdom, your glory? And then I want you to look on at verse six. 
And and this is kind of what I want to get to here. Paul says this. He says, being confident of this. In other words, Paul is like, I am absolutely sure this is going to happen. Being confident of this, he says, that he, and again, when he's talking about he, he's talking about about God here. He's saying that he who began a good work in you. Now, again, I want you to underline or highlight or circle that word you, because you here, he's talking about the church. And just to make sure that we're on the same page, because this is so important, Paul is is talking to the church here. He's talking to Christians. And so he says this, he says, so that he who began a good work, that he's talking about this good work, you know, that began in a Christian's life. He's talking about, you know, you know, those moments when, when people just like us, I mean, you know, you have to understand, I mean, there's no difference between those that were part of the church then and those that are part of the church now that, that he's talking about those moments when they said yes to Jesus, to following Jesus. They said no to self. They said no to the things of this world. They said yes to Jesus and becoming a follower of Jesus. That's the beginning of this good work. And, and the same is true of us, isn't it? The same is true of us that when we became a Christian, guess what? God began a good work in you. And I want you to hear that. And that's the reason that this, is, this message this morning is so important. The reason, for example, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter, you know, he's preaching to the thousands and thousands of people. We see this in the book of Acts chapter two. And in verse 38, as all these people were gathered there, he, you know, the people, it says, we're cut to the heart. What do we got to do to be saved? Peter says this. He says, I want you to repent. I want you to be, be baptized. Every one of you, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And he says this, he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so here's the thing. This is the reason it's so important is that when we give our hearts and lives over to Jesus, when we make that decision to follow him, then God begins to do a good work in us. In fact, he describes it like this. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and it's the work of the Spirit God in your heart. And and so according to Paul here, this is a good work that he begins in you. It's a good work. It's something new. It's something different. It's a change that is happening on the inside, working its way outward. And it's something that we can't do on our own. Not only that, and most of you know this, many of you can testify to this, this is something that God just doesn't do overnight, is it? I mean, you think about your own Christian life, your own experience, you know, the change that God begins in us through the Holy Spirit. It's not something that happens instantly, is it? Right? Right? It's not something that happens overnight. It's something that ultimately we would have to define it as a process. You know, it's, it's a process. When, when Jesus told the first disciples to follow me, you know, that idea of following him, I mean, that is a, that is a process. Yeah, it's true. You know, you make, in a moment, you make that decision that you say, you know, yeah, am I going to follow Jesus or no, am I not going to follow Jesus? That's a moment decision. Yes, I, yes, yes to Jesus or no to Jesus. That's in a moment. But, but here's the deal, you know, taking up your cross as the Bible describes it, you know, putting it on your back, you know, following Jesus with your life, that is a process, Right? You know, spiritual growth is a process. The Bible describes it like this. When we become Christians, we receive the Holy Spirit in our life through faith and obedience to Christ. The Bible calls us born again, born anew. From that point on, in fact, it says that we receive the Holy Spirit in our lives. We begin begin to grow. And how many of you know? I mean, you know this to be true. Growth takes time, doesn't it? It is. It's a process. It, 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 and then you think about it like this too. Okay, well, as Christians, what, what is our goal? What's the end game? The end game for us as Christians is spiritual maturity. That's what the Bible describes, spiritual maturity. The truth is maturity takes time, doesn't it? It's a process. In fact, Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to read you a couple of verses here that I think describe this so, so good. We're talking about what is our goal, what's the end game for us as Christians. Beginning in verse 12, it says the body of Christ it may be built up. And then continuing on verse 13, it says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become what? Mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's how Paul describes it to the church of Ephesus. Our goal as Christians is this idea of being full of Jesus, being full, having the fullness of Christ in our life. That's what maturity is. And here's the thing. I mean, you know this to be true. You can cram for an exam, but you cannot cram for maturity. It's the law of the harvest. You plant a seed, 
You make sure it has what it, what it needs to grow. And then what do you do? You wait. Be patient. Wait for it to grow. And in relation to what Paul is saying in our main text this morning here in Philippians chapter 1, he's saying this, he's saying this, he's saying, I'm absolutely confident that God is doing something in you. He's growing something in you. He's in, in, in Christian, brothers, sisters, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. Yeah, you may be a mess from time to time. Yeah, you may get frustrated with your messy circumstances or frustrated with the timing of things in your life. You may even get frustrated with yourself and, and thinking to yourself, you know, man, I, I just feel like I should be further along. I feel like I, I should be feeling this Jesus thing more in my life. I, I should be experiencing God more in, in my life. I'm just not seeing the results. I'm not seeing the spiritual fruit like I wish that I, that I saw. And, and there are times, again, as Christians, you know what? We have to make that confession. We just feel like a mess. But this is why I think this word is so good. And this is why I think this message is so important. And the promise is, and it continues on. You look there, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you. Again, notice he's talking about that work that's happening on the inside, right? It's on the inside working its way out. That he who began a good work in you will carry it on. Carry it on. There, there's this process that's involved. We'll carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And here, here's, here's, the key, here's the key of what we're talking about today. Christianity is not just behavior modification. We're seeing this a whole lot in our culture in America. It, it, it's not just behavior modification. What we're talking about is heart transformation. And there's a difference. Christianity is not just about being good. It's not just about always trying to behave, trying to stay out of trouble. What we see in the scriptures is that it's about God working through the Holy Spirit to change us, to renew our hearts in our minds. And it's a spiritual heart transplant, if you will. Where God's spirit, according to the Bible, dwells within us. Not just to be with us, but to actually transform us into his likeness. And share the change that's happening within us. And, and yeah, we should, you know, see it we should, we should eventually live it out in our lives. But it's something that begins on the inside and works its way outward. And truth be told, spiritual growth, maturity, it just takes time, doesn't it? It just takes time. So often, I've seen this true in my own life, that we, 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 we tend to cheapen our faith and we lessen this idea of God doing something in us to simply just thinking about, you know, this idea of following Jesus, the idea of being a Christian. You know, it's all about, you know what that is, you know, and I've even heard it described to other people before. You know, that's just simply God trying to keep you from something, right? God trying to keep you from a mess of some kind. God trying to keep you from something. But again, I hope that you see this, the message today and what you're seeing in the scripture today in Philippians here is that, you know, the reality is God, you know, you know and this is not, just, again, this is true for all of us here. You know, it's not God trying to keep us from something. It's God wanting to complete something in us. Just as Paul says here, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he says it like this again. This is what we already read. It says that he who began a good work in you will carry it on. And what's the key word there? To completion. Until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, that's our goal, isn't it? As Christians, as a church, that, that's what God wants for us. And, and I can tell you with all assuredness this morning, that's what God wants for you. He wants you to be mature. He wants you to be secure. 
He wants you to be maturing in your faith and he wants you to be maturing and becoming more and more like Jesus. And and he wants us to not only that, not only just to mature, but he wants us to be secure. And that is security in our relationship with God the Father. Our identity, I mean, think about it like this, and this is so true, this is so important. Our identity as God's creation comes not from the things of this world, right? I hope you understand that. Your identity does not come from the things of this world. It doesn't come from your job. It doesn't come from your career. It doesn't come from your accomplishments or lack thereof. It doesn't come from any kind of philosophy of life that you have. And and that's okay if you have philosophies in life. It doesn't come from some kind of political affiliation. Thank God for that. You know, it, it doesn't come from that. It doesn't come from, you know, something like a sexual identity. It is that a popular topic in our day and age, right? Sexual gender equality and all these kind of things. Our identities don't come from any of those things. Our identities come from our creator, which of course is God. That's our, that's our identity. And listen, listen, this is so important. That where your true sense of security comes from, in this life is when we cross over from just being a simple creation of God, because that's everybody. Whether we acknowledge God or not, everyone is a creation of God. Where our true sense of security comes from in this life is we cross over from being uh, just a creation of God to being identified as a child of God. And there is a difference because we become a child of God when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior in life and begin to follow him. What's great about this, the closer we get to God, guess what? The closer we get to our Heavenly Father, the more mature we become and the more secure we become as his child. Does that make sense? That's what God wants from us. Now let me just say this as I close this morning. This isn't just okay news. This is the good news. This is, this is the good news. And, and let me just say, it's not just good news for Christians. This is also good news for non-Christians. Let me kind of explain. Let me start with Christians. Christians, you know, all of us that, that, are, that are followers of Jesus today, this is such good news for us because what it's saying is God has begun a good work in you. All of us. Maybe that was when you were a child. Maybe that was when you were a teenager. Maybe that was when you were 20 or 40 or 60. I, I don't know. It really, that, that, that part doesn't matter. But that when you gave your life, your heart over to Jesus, when, when you followed him in faith and obedience, whenever you came to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, he began a good work in you. And that's not even the best part. The best part is simply this. God's not through with you yet. He's not. Not according to the Bible. Sometimes we still feel like we're such a mess. Sometimes we feel like an old country worn out song. The good news is God's not through with us yet. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, God who began a good work in you, the promise is that he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He wants you mature, he wants you secure, And he wants all of us as his church to be ready as the bride of Christ when he he returns. So that's the first part for those, uh, those, those that are Christians. If you're not a Christian today, let me just say this is also good news for you because if you're missing this out in your life, you're missing this area that we're talking about this morning and God has already been working in your heart, he's already been working in your soul today, you know, let me just say, this is why this is such good news. You are literally only one decision away from the best decision in your life. One decision away. You are literally one moment away of changing your destiny forever. And so it's good news whether we're Christians or not Christians because you have an opportunity to do that today. We're going to have an invitation, and as we do that, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for this message. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the gift that you gave us to be able to have a relationship with you And there's so many here this morning that have experienced that. 
It may have been years and years ago, God, when they first gave their hearts to you and you began a good work in them. And for others, it may be something very, very recent. But the point is, God, that what you began in us, the promise is, you're not through with this yet. And what you began in us is a good work that you're gonna carry on to completion. Until Jesus comes back for all those that are his, God, you're going to carry on what you began in us to completion. And we feel like a mess at times, God. You know, I'll be the first to say, God, there are times where I just feel like, you know, I am such a mess. I've created a mess. I have added to a mess. But I'm so thankful, God, that your love is unending. Your grace is like a river that I have to dip my life into each and every single day, each and every moment, it seems at times. And thank you for that. Thank you for the gift of Jesus and what it means to us. And not only that, God, but thank you for the opportunity that we still have for, for those that, that don't know you, that, that, that haven't yielded their life to you yet, that haven't you know, given you their heart and said yes to Jesus and yes to this whole salvation thing and yes to Christianity, because it's not about, you know we've said this all the time and this is so important, that God, it's not about us being perfect because we can't be, but it's about having a savior who is perfect. And him making the sacrifice for us to die for us so that we may have forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit in our life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna have an invitation this morning and uh, if you're here and you need prayer, if you're here and you have questions about this whole Christianity thing, what does it, what does it mean? I'll be up here, up forward and uh, up at the front, excuse me, and I'd love to pray with you. Um, whatever it is, we invite you to come. Let's stand together, let's sing our closing song.